welcome to the British Library. Thank you very much for coming, everybody, and a huge welcome to our online audience as well. Um, you are here in the warm embrace of the British Library, the home of words and people who love them. Um, I'm Bea Rolat of the Cultural Events Team. We do all sorts of weird and wild events here. Um, please sign up for events. You can do that just via the, the website so you can stay notified. Another thing that you should know about the library is our reading rooms. Not everybody knows what they are. We've got 11 of them, plus one up in Boston Spa, which is our Yorkshire site, and they're just magnificent spaces. And anyone can join, and it's free. All you need are two forms of ID to go into these magnificent spaces and, and access a world of every era of written archive, plus some of the poshest chairs in London. Did I mention it's free? It's your library. Anyway, tonight is a celebration of a new and unbelievably thrilling addition to our collections. Um, thanks to Friends of the National Libraries, the Honours Field collection has been brought into the public domain. This was a, 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 a private collection of previously unseen manuscripts of all kinds of amazing writers, Jane Austen, Walter Scott, as well as the Brontes. Um, it's been saved for the public now and will live forevermore not in a secret private library, but for the, for the Bronte collections in the Bronte Parsonage, the Brotherton Library in Leeds, and right here in the British Library. Now, Blake's going to tell you more about this, but suffice to say, I actually burst into tears when I saw Emily's notebook, previously unseen, in real life for the first time. Um, it's impossible to articulate, really, the kind of electricity you get from seeing something, the real thing. Um, it's incredibly moving. So who could we possibly ask to illuminate and give context to such an important acquisition? Who else but Blake Morrison? Blake is a poet and novelist and the author of two best-selling memoirs and his play based on the Brontes, We Are Three Sisters, is available to buy on the platform on our online link, so knock yourself out right now. Um, he's also the Professor of Creative and Life Writing at Goldsmiths University. And to give voice to Emily Bronte is the acclaimed actor and writer Kate Ashfield, a star of the stage and screen, known and loved in Sanditon, Line of Duty, Shaun of the Dead. Kate's also a BAFTA-nominated writer who created Channel 4's Born to Kill. And tonight she's taking us onto the wild and stormy moors. So there'll be time for questions afterwards, so please have some. Uh, if you're watching online, just pop your questions in the box below. I think it's below. Um, but it's time now for No Coward Soul. So a huge applause, please, for Blake and for Kate. The Old Stoic. Riches I hold in light esteem, and love I laugh to scorn, and lust of fame was but a dream that vanished with the morn. And if I pray, the only prayer that moves my lips for me is leave the heart that I now bear and give me liberty. Yes, as my swift days near their goal, tis all that I implore. Through life and death, a chainless soul with courage to endure. Thank you. Well, when I was wondering which of Emily Bronte's poems to begin with tonight, I did think of using the one which has no coward soul in it, because after all, it's a great slogan. You could put it, imagine it across a t shirt no coward soul. But then I think a chainless soul can compete. No coward soul. That poem was chosen by another Emily, a poet, Emily Dickinson, to be read at her funeral. But the one that Kate's just read, I think it just epitomises what sets Emily apart. Um, that she is brave, there's courage mentioned in it, she's independent-minded, she's careless of wealth or fame, riches I holding light esteem. She's scornful of love, it seems, which is surprising. Um, and, of course, she was fond of telling anyone who put pressure on her um, or complained about her shyness. She liked to say, I wish to be as God made me. Or, as she puts it in a poem, uh, I'll walk where my own nature would be leading. 
it vexes me to choose another guide. Um, so, as her sister Charlotte put it, she was altogether unbending. And Charlotte's love of Emily was mixed with exasperation at this unbendingness, particularly during Emily's final weeks when she would not allow any poisoning doctor to visit and to attempt to treat her consumption. Uh, when she did finally agree to see a doctor, it was too late. She died two hours later. Um, as Charlotte wrote to her friend Ellen Nussie, we saw her taken from life in her prime. In her prime, 175 years ago, aged only 30. But it isn't altogether a case of promise unfulfilled because after all, in Wuthering Heights, she left behind one of the most popular and discussed novels in the English language. The frustration is that she left so little else beside that novel and the poems. Um, about three brief uninformative letters, a few short diary pages that she and Anne wrote every four weeks, every four years or so. Um, and no second novel, it seems. Um, there was a suggestion that she was working on one. Um, and I just read a contemporary novel uh, in which uh, she goes and buries it in the parsonage graveyard, or the, the text that she'd been uh, composing. Um, in that same novel, Emily comes across a couple who are making love and herself, as a result, masturbates. Uh, so you could perhaps treat that idea of burying the novel with the same scepticism as I treated that sex scene. Um, but I have talked to people at the Parsonage who say they have sometimes come across people digging, <laughs> digging around in the hope of turning up some valuable Brontiana. Anyway, it's perhaps precisely because of the paucity, the lack of Emily material, that she has become perhaps the most romantic, uh, exotic, even glamorous, of uh, the three sisters, um, an empty sheet on which we can impose <laughs> our own images and our own interpretations. The less we have of her, the more there is to say. Um, and grand theories come up all the time that she was anorexic, um, that she was sociopathic, that she was eager for death. Um, and as well as the scholarly theorizing, there's the Emily of popular culture, as celebrated by Kate Bush, Yoko Ono, by Sylvia Plath, Ted Hughes, Anne Carson in poetry, by any number of TV and film and theater adaptations of Wuthering Heights or portrayals of the Brontes as a family. Well, I confess to having make a, made a couple of contributions of that kind myself. I wrote back in my 30s a libretto for the musical of Wuthering Heights um, with Howard Goodall, who you may have heard of, as the composer. And, well, we seemed to get quite a long way. Lester Haymarket were talking about putting it on until they discovered there were several other musical versions of Wuthering Heights doing the rounds, including one with Cliff Richard uh, <laughs> set up to play Heathcliff. Uh, that, of course, was the one that was made and uh, staged. And then, more recently, as being mentioned, uh, I, I did uh, worked on a play with Northern Broadsides called We Are Three Sisters, um, which took its cue from Chekhov's play, which may sound a bit weird, but there are parallels that you could work with. Um, and I remember a girl coming to see a performance of, of the play in Halifax, um, she was about 12 years old and she was absolutely desperate to meet the actor who played Emily. Not because there was anything special about that performance or anything, but she was just so beguiled by the aura of Emily-ness. Um, well, for myself, I've been a slower convert. Um, I, I find my affections varying from year to year. Um, in my teens, I got interested in the Brontes because of where, where I lived. Um, so, um, you know, to make parallels with the Brontes, I suppose you 
you have to live in a rectory, I did. Um, you have to live in a rectory at the top of a village, I did. You, 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 could, you have to live in a village called Thornton, if not Haworth, because the Brontes lived in Thornton, so did I, different Thornton. You had to have an Irish parent, yep, my mother was Irish. Um, and you had to have a view of the moors, yep, I had that too. Um, so, you know, and mine was just, you know, an ordinary dysfunctional family like, like theirs. Um, I think Charlotte was my first love. I don't think anybody, any school child could read Jane Eyre and not be engaged, particularly by the opening sections of it. And then more recently, Anne, uh, Anne has drawn me because of her portrayal of alcoholism in The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Uh, earlier this year, I published a book, Two Sisters, which is in part about my sister's drink problems. Oh, and now they brought about her death, not very many miles from Haworth. Then there's Branwell, who always haunts and frustrates me, promise unfulfilled, the privileged boy to whom so much was given and of whom so much was hoped. And he said of himself, in all my past life, I have done nothing either great or good. And these days, as I get older, I think of Patrick, uh, who survived, I think, to the age of, was it 84? He outlived all his children, which no parent wants to do, and who little or no idea of his three daughters' extensive literary output. Uh, in one scene in the play I wrote, um, partly inspired by the account that Elizabeth Gaskell gave, um, I, I dramatised the moment that um, Charlotte tells her father that she has published a novel. Now, now, Charlotte, as long as there's food on the table and needlework to, needlework to occupy you, what more in life do you need? There is one thing. What's that, pray? Books. I couldn't live without books. True enough. We're all readers in this house. And not just readers. Every night when you're in bed, we write. Oh, I know. You're always writing letters. Not just letters, stories, poems. Oh, I was a bit of a poet myself in my youth. What I'm trying to say is that I've written a book. Oh, have you, my dear? Yes, and, and I'd like you to read it. I can't. It'd be wasted on me. But your eyesight's good now. You said, so, said it yourself. Even so, I can never make out your writing. It's not a manuscript. It's printed. But the cost. How could you afford it? I didn't pay for it to be printed, a publisher did. They must be daft. <laughs> Nobody's heard of you. I've chosen a different name. Courier Bell, see? What good will that do? No one's heard of him either. No, but the book seems to be selling. I bought you some reviews. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll try a page or two. But you mustn't forget your duties. Books can't be the business of a woman's life. Of course not, Father. Um, to come back to Emily um, and what I was saying about how little of her work we have, one aspect of this is the invisibility of the notebook in which she transcribed her poems. This was the notebook which Charlotte said she accidentally lighted on and which left her with a deep conviction that these were not common effusions not at all like the poetry women generally write. To my ear, they had a peculiar music, wild, melancholy and elevated. Evidently angered by Charlotte's intrusiveness, Emily took some persuading that the poems were worth making public. But a selection of them appeared, along with poems by Anne and Charlotte, in an edition in 1846, which sold just two copies. Um, as to Emily's notebook, it ended up in the ownership of the Victorian industrialist William Law. It became known as the Honrusfield Manuscript, and at some point, after photographs were taken of it back in the 1920s or 30s, it disappeared from view. It is now missing, Janet Gazari writes on the first page of her introduction to the Penguin edition of Emily's poems, and for his OUP edition of the poems, Derek Roper 
is similarly handicapped, saying the notebook has been inaccessible to scholars for more than 50 years. Well, make that nearly 90 years. It was only in 2021, as B was saying, that tranches of the Honrosfield collection were put up for auction, and only last year that the British Library announced that thanks to a £15 million fundraising campaign and in partnership with the Parsonage and the Brotherton Library in Leeds, a substantial collection of manuscripts has been acquired which will permanently remain in Britain and in the public domain, chief among them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 good, good news, yes. <laughs> uh, alongside Jane Austen, Robert Burns, Walter Scott, work by the Brontes. Will it make you jealous if I tell you I held that notebook in my hands? Yes, it will. In this very building, just a couple of months ago. Marvelling that Emily's hand had held it too, yes. A tiny bound volume at seven inches by four inches. It's smaller than a paperback. And even tinier in neat but barely legible ink. 31 of Emily's poems, most of them carefully dated. The first four composed in the space of five weeks when she was 19, all handwritten and crammed into 21 pages. On some pages, so crammed that she squeezes in as many as 52 lines with spacing in between the stanzas. Uh, in, my in my excitement, I made the mistake of going to the manuscript room without a pair of glasses. Uh, and had to retrieve them from the cloakroom in the basement, I, a magnifying glass would have been better still. Well, as William Law wrote in pencil at the front of that notebook, it is the most valuable of all the Mon Bronte manuscripts that I possess. It was a privilege and a bit spooky to read it. Uh, and to marvel, among other things, at Emily's weird and wonderful misspellings. Beauty, B E U. T Y, bosom, B O S E M, busy, B U I -S, -S, S Y, um, magic, M A J I C, and best of all, I think, for watch, W H A C H. Um, I was lucky, but everybody can be lucky. You, you, you can, if you go to the Brotherton Library, you can see as well as. Uh, that notebook, you can see the seven miniature books that Charlotte wrote and put together as a child, one of which begins, Reader, I tell you what my heart is like to break, which is a bit of a, a pre-echo of Reader, I married him. Um, there's a pencil sketch Emily did, age 10, of a mullioned window. There's the 10 poems that Anne wrote, while none too happily working as a governess. Letters from Branwell to Hartley Coleridge, who'd been encouraging him. First editions of the novels. And then there's more at the Parsonage in Haworth, where along with the usual stuff, you know, the portable writing desks and the John Martin paintings and Charlotte's trunk, there's a diary paper Emily wrote. There's a book of rhymes Charlotte wrote at the age of 13. There's a watercolour she did of a peasant woman what she did at 12. You know, I'm being selective here. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for a very short period to see this range of material on display till the end of October and for free. So go and, um, yeah, take the steam train to Haworth while you're at it. Emily's lost, rediscovered notebook is now at the Brotherton Library open on the last spread with Emily's No Coward Soul on the right and opposite under a, another poem, a note added seemingly by Charlotte that reads, never was better stuff penned. Mm -hmm. Charlotte found the poems terse, vigorous, wild and elevating. Maybe, I confess, it's taken me some time to come round to them. M my taste for poetry was formed in adolescence, by T.S. Eliot, D.H. Lawrence, Wilfred Owen, W.H. Sorden, and whereas Wordsworth, Blake and Coleridge and later Tennyson Browning won me over, Emily felt sort of old-fashioned beside them mm. in some way. Perhaps 
a whiff of religiosity in her verse put me off, though I, I see now she was more pantheistic than Christian and could be scornful about church worship, dismissing religious creeds as unutterably vain, worthless as withered weeds. <clears throat> so if it wasn't her ideas I took against, perhaps it was the insistence of her rhymes and the constraint of those quatrains. She doesn't sound modern, I thought, or rather she didn't strike me as modern until you listen to a poem like this. Here the world is chill, turf sod and tombstone, dank moss dripping from the wall. What gloomy guests beneath the turf, beneath the mould, the common path that others run. There was a time when my cheek burned, love like a rose briar, the house dog on the glowing floor. Sweet land of light, I saw my fate without its mask, this wild breeze with me. My darling pain, the little lamp burns straight, dreading every breeze. The night is darkening around me, I'll walk where flocks are feeding and the wind blows on the mountainside. I'm true to my wild will. Oh, I'd love to pretend that somehow in that notebook people had missed this poem of Emily's, but I'm cheating. Those are, uh, in a way I'm cheating, and not every, every line there is an Emily line. Um, but you can see if you isolate them from the quatrains and the rhymes, how much they stand out. You know, my darling pain, what a line that is. Um, I'm true to my wild will sounds very... Emily, and that house dog on the glowing floor. Um, the, the images draw you back and make you look at the poems again. One effect for me of rereading that notebook was to think, question, I suppose, the idea of her unworldliness. See, I mean, to me, she's much more grounded than that suggests. And to my mind, what defines her isn't soulfulness so much, but the way... She defies or complicates gender stereotypes. Charlotte, remember, said her poems were not at all like the poetry women generally write. And she noted how Emily was stronger than a man in, in battling her Ill last illness. Monsieur Hegier, was it Hegier or Hegier, the Brussels teacher with whom Charlotte was infatuated, said Emily should have been a man and pay, paid tribute to her imperious will the assistant curate, William Waitman, maybe had something similar in mind when he nicknamed her The Major, uh, which was a name that Charlotte took up and teased her with. Um, and certainly her behaviour sometimes displayed a militaristic ruthlessness and violence. Um, much as she loved animals, for example, there's, there's the story of the time when she punished her dog Keeper who uh, had a habit of lying on the beds upstairs in the parsonage, which was not allowed. And when Emily discovered it, she punished a keeper by beating him in the eyes with her fists to the point that his eyes and head swelled up. There was also the incident when uh, that Charlotte reported to Elizabeth Gaskell when Emily was bitten by a mad dog and, fearing rabies, took one of uh, Tabby's red-hot irons from the fire and no messing cauterized the wound. And another episode when she separated Keeper and another dog by spraying pepper in their eyes. Um, add to that um, the reply when asked by Patrick how to deal with Branwell if he was naughty. She said, well, first reason with him, and if he doesn't listen to reason, whip him. Um, and then those stories also of, of her shooting with Patrick, firing a pistol, uh, which uh, supposedly she was very good at. Um, as to Charlotte's suggestion that she had no worldly wisdom, um, that she was unadapted to practical life, well, when the Bronte sisters were left money um, on their aunt's death and shares, it was Emily who put in the work of checking that their investments in the railways were financially sound carefully reading every paragraph and every advertisement in the newspapers that related to railroads. 
So in the writing too, I think the sort of traditional gender bi binaries break down. There are two narrators in Wuthering Heights, of course, one a man, Mr. Lockwood, the other a woman, Nellie. Meanwhile, Catherine thinks that she and the man she loves are indistinguishable. Nellie, I am Heathcliff. He's more myself than I am. So there's no simple division between him and her. And of course, Emily herself experienced a switch of gender when she took on a pseudonym and became Ellis Bell, a name everybody assumed was that of a man. When she was furious when um, Charlotte, on a trip to see their publishers in London, exposed their real names and said, we are three sisters. And I think Emily's anger wasn't just the invasion of her privacy. Um, it was that this adoption of a male name had been liberating for her, that she published Wuthering Heights with a freedom that she, and lack of inhibition she'd not have enjoyed writing as Emily. So rather like Cathy telling Nellie, I am Heathcliff, you can imagine Emily saying to Charlotte, but, but I am Ellis Bell. Um, so I don't want to push this too far. I'm not saying, uh, you know, Emily is gender bender, Emily is trans, bisexual, but, and I'm certainly not recruiting her to the patriarchy. Against her embrace of Ellis Bellism, you have to remember her pursuit of domestic tasks. She was the most industrious of the sisters when it came to household tasks such as ironing, cooking, taking charge in the kitchen. What on earth is half so dear, so longed for as the hearth of home, she writes in one poem. But she enjoyed her imaginative traveling beyond home and beyond sisterly identity. Certainly the brutishness of Heathcliff isn't as repellent to Emily as it was to Charlotte. Emily didn't just create him, she toyed with the idea that Cathy somehow embodied him. At any rate, it's precisely Heathcliff's bedrock manliness that Cathy esteems, in contrast to the foppishness or the pallor of her husband, Edgar. As she tells Nellie. My great thought in living is himself. If all else perished and he remained, I should still continue to be. And if all else remained and he were annihilated, the universe would turn into a mighty stranger. I should not seem a part of it. My love for Linton is like the foliage in the woods. Time will change it. I'm well aware as winter changes the trees. My love for Heathcliff resembles the eternal rocks beneath. A source of little visible delight, but necessary. Nellie, I am Heathcliff. He's always, always in my mind, not as a pleasure, any more than I am always a pleasure to myself, but as my own being. So don't talk of our separation again. It's impractical. The opposing metaphors there for the two men, Linton as foliage that rots, Heathcliff as rocks that endure. Maybe that and maybe those metaphors are not unusual in expressing the difference between a light affection on the one hand and a deep love on the other. And yet the context in which they've spoken to Nellie, a housekeeper, by a woman who's burying the child of a man of foliage but is in love with the man of rocks. I think this sets it apart from any novel of female infidelity such as Madame Bovary. It's impossible to imagine anybody, anybody but Emily having written that passage and it's the passion I think in that passage more than any other that makes generations of readers still passionate about Wuthering Heights. Interestingly one of Emily's poems is based on a similar pair of opposed metaphors. Love and friendship. Love is like the wild rose briar, friendship like the holly tree. The holly is dark when the rose bar blooms, but which will bloom most constantly? The wild rose briar is sweet in spring. Its summer blossoms scent the air. Yet wait till winter comes again, and who will call the wild briar fair? Then scorn the silly rose wreath now, and deck thee with the holly's sheen. 
that when December blights thy brow, he may still leave thy garland green. So here the foliage is the wild rose briar, and the rock, as it were, is holly as an evergreen. Holly sticks around like a rock as opposed to the deciduous seasonal faltering of a rose. In other words, friendship endures, whereas love is ephemeral. Now, you could say that as a personal poem. Perhaps this is Emily's real view that she values friendship more than love. Love I laugh to scorn, we heard earlier on in the poem. And after all, Kathy's love for Heathcliff partly derives from the friendship they formed in childhood. It seems unlikely, though, in, in, that, that Emily would be dismissive of love to that extent. And in the end, we have to say, well, we don't know what she truly thinks. She's a young woman in her 20s playing around with ideas, playing around with verse forms and novelistic devices. Play isn't something we associate very readily with the Brontes. You know, the myth swamps them in earnestness, duty, labour, illness, and death, of course. I never caused a smile of joy since I was born, one Emily poem says. I see around me tombstones grey, another begins. And then there was the memory of those that she lost. By the age of six, her mother and two sisters, and later her beloved aunt, and Branwell. For time and death and mortal pain give wounds that will not heal again. So much trauma. But I, I'm suspicious of the theory that Emily had any sort of death wish. In her last diary note, she described herself as having learnt to make the most of the present and hope for the future with less fidgetiness that I cannot do all I wish merely desiring that everybody could be as comfortable as myself and as undesponding. Lovely word, that, undesponding. And she says she's comfortable. And in those diary notes, she always imagines herself four years ahead with, some, with someone, I think, longing to be gone would not do. Added to which, there's Charlotte's description of her being torn, panting and reluctant from life. What's also striking, and here there's playfulness too, is that when she's writing about death, and equally as she did so often when writing about night, how energised she is. Darkness isn't scary. Gloom kicks her into life. When the sisters got together in the evening to write, imagination set them free. And in Emily's case, working at night, seemed to prompt her to write so often about night in the poems. There shines the moon at noon of night. The night was dark, yet winter breathed. The starry night shall tidings bring. How I do love on summer nights. The moon is full this winter night. I know that tonight the wind is sighing, and so on. Many more examples. Best of all, I think, for its terseness is the night is darkening round me. The night is darkening round me, the wild winds coldly blow, but a tyrant spell has bound me and I cannot, cannot go. The giant trees are bending, their bare boughs weighed with snow, and the storm is fast descending, and yet I cannot go. Clouds beyond clouds above me, wastes beyond wastes below, but nothing drear can move me. I will not, cannot go. You'd think with a coming storm and wild winds and bending trees that the mood would be fearful, but to me, Emily's tone is defiant rather than passive. She's trapped, but the poem's repetitions are animated rather than crushed. I will not, cannot go. The poem reminds me in some ways of Robert Frost's stopping by woods on a snowy evening where the speaker is similarly unable to move as, as, if, as if too mesmerised. And for, for Emily, there's a similar sense of enchantment that comes through and those five repetitions of not. Or perhaps it's just stubbornness. No, she damn well won't move. 
She's like Thomas Hardy and Philip Larkin in this respect. <coughs> never, never so alive as when looking at the worst that life can bring. And there's always light in the darkness as we find in her poem, Stars. Ah, oh, why, because the dazzling sun restored our earth to joy, have you departed, every one, and left a desert sky? All through the night your glorious eyes were gazing down in mine, and with a full heart's thankful sighs, I blessed that watch divine. I was at peace and drank your beams as they were life to me, and reveled in my changeful dreams like petrel on the sea. Thought followed thought, star followed star, through boundless regions on, while one sweet influence near and far thrilled through and proved us one. Why did the morning dawn to break so great, so pure a spell, and scorch with fire the tranquil cheek where your cool radiance fell? Blood red he rose, and arrows straight, his fierce beams struck my brow. The soul of nature sprang elate, but mine sank sad and low. My lids closed down, yet through their veil I saw him blazing still, and steep in gold the misty dale and flash upon the hill. I turned me to the pillow then, to call back night, and see your worlds of solemn light again throb with my heart and me. It would not do. The pillow glowed, and glowed both roof and floor. And birds sang loudly in the wood, and fresh winds shook the door. The curtain waved, the wakened flies were murmuring round my room, imprisoned there till I should rise and give them leave to roam. O oh, stars and dreams and gentle night, O oh, night and stars return, and hide me from the hostile light that does not warm but burn that drains the blood of suffering men, drinks tears instead of dew. Let me sleep through his blinding rain and only wake with you. I think you could hear in, in Kate's reading there that the two different ways of addressing it, the stars in the poem are, are addressed intimately as you, whereas the sun is a bullying he. They are peaceful. He is warlike. Their eyes gen gaze gently into her eyes, whereas he's hostile, scorching, blinding, a light that doesn't comfort but burns. The stars allow her to dream and imagine. The sun's a tyrannical monarch who reigns over and imprisons her. So as with, as, as with the foliage and the rocks and the rose briar and the holly, the metaphors are opposed and they're loaded. However elusive Emily often seems, here she's emphatic and, dare I say it, almost confessional. There's a battle going on and it's plain where her allegiances lie. John Donne's O oh Busy Old Son rebukes the son for breaking in on him when he's lying in bed with his lover. Emily, too, resents the son's bullying intrusion. But her poem is solitudinous. And it's composed as a lovely plaint and plea. Just give me the stars, tender gaze. Of course, she loved the daylight too. Without it, she wouldn't have been able to walk on the moors so freely and to see the abundance they offered. The moors meant freedom and independence to her. And those are the qualities I most associate with her. She isn't as biddable or as worried about public opinion as Charlotte, or as religious-minded as Anne. She doesn't identify freedom with escape either. She did little travelling beyond Haworth and was so homesick during the brief periods she sent away, teaching or in Brussels, that she returned home in a deep depression, almost a kind of breakdown. Home was where she found independence. And this comes through very strongly, I think, in the poem, A Little While, A Little While. A little while, a little while, the noisy crowd are barred away, and I can sing and I can smile, 
a little while I've holy day. Where wilt thou go, my harassed heart? For many a land invites thee now, and places near and far apart have rest for thee, my weary brow. There is a spot mid barren hills where winter howls and driving rain, but if the dreary tempest chills, there is a light that warms again. The house is old, the trees are bare, and moonless bends the misty dome. But what on earth is half so dear, so longed for as the hearth of home? The mute birds sitting on the stone, the dank moss dripping from the wall, the garden walk with weeds are grown. I love them, how I love them all. Shall I go there, or shall I seek another clime, another sky? where tongues familiar music speak in accents dear to memory. Yes, as I mused, the naked room, the flickering firelight died away, and from the midst of cheerless gloom, I passed to bright, unclouded day. A little and a lone green lane that opened on a common wide, a distant, dreamy, dim blue chain, of mountains circling every side. A heaven so clear, an earth so calm, so sweet, so soft, so hushed an air, and deepening like the dreamlike charm, wild moor sheep feeding everywhere. That was the scene. I knew it well. I knew the pathways near and far, that winding are each billowy swell, marked out the tracks of wandering deer. Could I have lingered but an hour? It well had paid a week of toil, but truth has banished fancy's power. I hear my dungeon bars recoil. Even as I stood with raptured eye, absorbed in bliss so deep and dear, my hour of rest had fleeted by and given me back to weary care. Charlotte said of Emily that an interpreter ought always to have stood between her and the world. And after Emily's death, Charlotte appointed herself to that role by editing some of the lines in her poems, taking over, taking charge, if you like, as though a parent handling, handling an awkward adolescent. Of all the items in the recently unearthed notebook, that poem that you've just heard is the one that Charlotte interfered with the most. It may be she thought it too juvenile. Emily wrote it when she was just 20, I think. Or it may be she was trying to remove it from the context of the Gondal poems. But it was written about Howarth at a time when Emily was away teaching at Law Hill, and it's clearly autobiographical, not least when she refers to her pupils as a noisy crowd. Uh, to Emily, who hated company outside her family any more than a couple of people could be called a crowd, I think. She was said to be more interested in the house dog than in any of her pupils. Charlotte, though, deleted the noisy crowd and put the weary task instead. Later, Emily describes the garden walk with weeds or grown. Charlotte changed this to the innocuous gable grey, the walk, as if eager to protect the parsonage's reputation as a respectable place, not one <laughs> overrun by weeds. Uh, I mean, this, this finicky weeding out of weeds um, is particularly surprising because Charlotte famously objected to the landscape of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice as being too neat. Uh, a carefully fenced, highly cultivated garden with neat borders and delicate flowers, she complained. No open country, no fresh air, no blue hill, no bonny beck. But there she is, neatening up Emily's poem. And her rewrites of Emily continue through the poem. I counted 16 corrections. She also removed a whole stanza. Emily's mountains become moorland, because that's perhaps true of Howarth. Um, Emily's deer become sheep for the same reason. Finally, I hear my dungeon bars recoil becomes 
restraint and heavy task or recoil, as if the mention of dungeon bars is excessive. So in effect, some of the most expansive images in the poem, weeds, dungeons, deer, mountains, are removed in order to tamp it down. That's why Charlotte's revisions and, uh, if you like, her management of her sister's reputations have become increasingly difficult subjects over the year. Um, for, from questioning whether it's right that a creature like Heathcliff should ever have been allowed to exist, I scarcely think it is, Charlotte said, to calling Anne's the tenant of Wildfell Hall an entire mistake. Um, She's seen as a busybody, as a, a control freak. But if you read some of the hostile notices of her sister's work with Wuthering Heights, dismissed as wild, confused, disjointed, one of the most repellent books we ever read, odiously, abominably pagan, compounded of vulgar depravity, the reader is shocked, disgusted, etc. You can understand what made Charlotte uncomfortable. And if that meant conceding too much and apologising for her younger sisters as immature, well, you have to recall that she did also defend and praise them and was undoubtedly mired in terrible grief after their deaths. So against those who demonise Charlotte as self-righteous and authoritarian, a meddler, let's also remember... Uh, her own anxiety about her, her worth or her anxiety about her own worth. One, one item I enjoyed seeing in the newly unearthed Honorsfield archive was a letter from Charlotte to a novelist called Julia Kavanagh, which was tucked inside the first edition of Jane Eyre, uh, which shows her in a characteristically self-deprecating mood. She tells Julia that her novel is but a defective production and I only wish it had been in my power to offer you some less insipid token of my esteem. In outliving Emily and Anne by several years, Charlotte enjoyed more acclaim than they did, but she knew that much of that acclaim was for them, that she was their representative on earth, a wiser head perhaps, but not necessarily their superior as a writer. In the end, what I took away from that little notebook in the British Library and the one that's now on display in the Brotherton, get that train up north, um, <laughs> that it wasn't a spiritual Emily, but it was a worldly Emily. Yes, you, you know, you get the, abs the, the, the capitalised abstractions and the hymn-like incantations, the images of her as a foster child of sore distress. But there's this rapt homespun intentiveness to the physical world around her. And that's when she's at her truest. The moths fluttering among the heath and harebells. The old church tower and garden wall black with autumn rain. Two trees in a lonely field. High waving heather. Wild moor sheep. The linnet trilling its song on an old granite stone. Drizzly mist. Winter sun setting in a sullen sky. Dank moss dripping from a wall. Leaves full of sap. Grey flocks in ferny dens. Bees among the heather bells. A little and a lone green lane opening on a common. The house dog stretched on the glowing floor. A little lamp burning. A cheerful hearth. An open parlour window. The holly and the rose briar. The wild wind blowing on the mountainside. These were the commonplace riches that Emily held in high esteem. The ordinary world around us, or what's left of it now that nature has been so depleted. When did you last see or hear a linnet? And those, to me, are the reasons that Emily's work endures 175 years on from her birth, from her birth and 145 from her death. It's always difficult to untangle the lives of the Brontes from what they wrote. We read Wuthering Heights and wonder how Emily, who never, as far as we know, had a sexual relationship or anything close to it with anyone, could know so much about sexual passion. We read Jane Eyre and wonder how much Charlotte's love for Monsieur Hergé in Brussels informs her portrayal of Rochester. 
And we think of Anne saying, just before she died, that she longs to do some good in the world before she leaves it. And how her last words to Charlotte take courage are very like the last words that Seamus Heaney said, though he sent them in a text in Latin, Noli Timere. What a family they were, the Brontes, and two centuries on, they're still very much with us. How and why their work is still so affecting, why the unforgotten dead are still alive, why we still read the Brontes, why they're still with us, I think that's beautifully captured in a poem that will conclude this little talk. It's a poem by my colleague at Goldsmiths, Maura Dooley. It appears in a recent, a new collection, 555. The Unforgotten. At Anne Bronte's grave, in the salt air she loved, where the words were almost lost from the stone, dissolving, you first kissed me. And once we took my parents to see the rain, the moorland, the tiny writing we struggled to read, stepping out dazed into that garden of tombs, gleaming in the damp light. And sometimes I swipe at crumbs or dry plates with my souvenir linen image of three melded heads, fading, indistinct. But today, I open a beaten copy of the novels of the Bronte sisters, Pilot 1947. The only thing left of my grandmother's time on earth to read in her bold, emphatic hand. Nearer than the living are the unforgotten dead. Their presence is ever with you and they walk always at your side. A huge thanks to Blake Morrison and to Kate Ashfield for, for that extraordinary response to the work and for Kate for taking us to walk at Emily Bronte's side. I think that was so moving. Um, we've got time for some questions from the audience. Um, if you'd just like to put your hand up, my colleagues are, are coming through. Anybody who isn't an immediate family member of mine, <laughs> please. All right, okay. I'm really curious. I may have missed something because we were a little bit late, but I'm really curious about the archive and the missing manuscript and why I mean obviously it was known that he had it and he hadn't destroyed it and why he didn't allow people to see it and then I also want to know how it felt for you I mean you did take us there a bit but how it felt for you to hold the yeah, well yeah that was obviously <laughs> that's very exciting to, uh, to touch these pages that you knew Emily had touched to where her pen had gone on them it's it is bound not by her as well um but your, the first part of your question was about how did it, you know, wh how did it go missing for so long? <coughs> I mean, I don't know enough about the, the William Law's family. Um, I think it's always been assumed that, it, you know, it must, it must have come in some way, been either discovered or hidden away in, in, uh, in, in, his, in, his, in his family archive, that relations who inherited it hadn't looked properly, or they were sitting on it. I don't know. And I mean, I've asked questions of people and who know more about it than I do, and they they seem to think it's you know a bit of a secret, so, the circumstances. But um, obviously, it's a, it's a big thing that's only emerged in the last last two years. Um, an, an exciting discovery. Blake's absolutely right that you must get the train up north and go to the Brotherton Library in Leeds because it really is sensational. You can also access these materials via the British Library website. Um, are there any other questions? I'll come to you. Yeah, thank you very much for both uh, contributions, very stimulating. But I just want Blake to ask, to comment on your representation of the Reverend Patrick Bronte, if I might say so. He would have spoken with a strong Irish accent. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> having come from a poor background in Ireland and winning a scholarship to Cambridge and therefore somebody of considerable intellect. But not only that, as I'm sure you know much better than me, he published a full-length 
short book in, po in the form of poetry, the maid of something. I forget what she's the maid of. But this is a, a guy with a formidable intellectual background uh, who himself is a published writer. And I think in all the discussion of the Brontes, uh, that tends to be lost. And I think that dialogue, which I know probably Mrs. Gaskell represented, what did he say to Charlotte? She's published a book, Children. You know, that may have been kind of playing with the theme on his part. Anyway, I think he gets a bad press on that particular conversation. Yeah, no, uh, um, it's a very fair point. Um, I apologize that I didn't put on an Irish accent, but I'm very bad at that. <laughs> Putting on accents. You're right, he's formidable. Uh, I, I don't know his poetry, I confess, and I should. He's the one I should cap catch up on properly next. But I know he campaigned, didn't he, fiercely too, locally about the water, the quality of the water supply. That he was, didn't he write letters to newspapers against dueling? He thought dueling was a terrible habit that should be, dueling should be banned. And, you know, as you say, a man of formidable intellect, absolutely. Did he change his name to a be more posh? The Bronte? Oh, yes, Bronte. <coughs> others, I'm no Bronte scholar, and there, there may be others here who know why Bronte became Bronte, um, because it sounded less Irish, sounded less... Yeah, I think definitely that was the reason, yeah. yeah. Um, also, wasn't it... I mean, he, he published books about children's education as well, didn't he? I think he published some sort of moral stories considered suitable for children. Um, wasn't it actually Trollope who wrote to Charlotte Bronte saying that literature could not be a woman's? It, well, I think life. it was Southey, wasn't it Robert Southey? Oh, was it Southey? I it was, think. Yeah, I mean, she got, I, th I know she got a negative response from, uh, it might have been Southey, yeah. That's the bit that Patrick says typical. to her, what, books can't be yeah. business a woman's life, is actually... So I think Southey, Southey yeah. Right, okay. Not Patrick. Tro I know Trollope Pat said something nasty as well. Tro Trollope probably, yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, thank you very much. This was incredibly interesting, and you uh, quoted one of my favorite passages of um, uh, Water in Heights. I apologize for my accent, but I'm originally Italian, so this is my second language. I have to say that at, at times I was a bit surprised by your reading of some aspects of the novel, but that might be a bit uh, of too much influence of Terry Eagleton's <laughs> um, uh, essay, I think, on, uh, on the matter. And when it comes to um, the gentleman who quoted the, who, who mentioned the father, I have to say, I love the fact that just as with uh, the King Richard uh, movie, we have exceptional women, and all of a sudden, for no reason whatsoever, um, it seems necessary to go look into the influence of uh, the paternal figure. <laughs> and I, I kind of, uh, I mean, I'm sure that um, he was an exceptional uh, scholar, but. Um, and uh, supposedly in those days, probably uh, admission to Cambridge and Oxford was a bit different than what it is today. But um, generally when you get a scholarship and if you get it as a cleric, isn't it mostly because you are a hardworking guy, not so much that you're a genius? Well, I think you'd have to have a, a degree of intellect and given his very modest background in, in Ireland, it, it was kind of astonishing that he ended up there. I don't think the point that, you know, it's not taking anything away from the achievement of the sisters to say that their father was a formidable figure. Um, you could give him some credit for ignoring what went on every evening in the, in, when they were writing, <laughs> you know, turning a blind eye to it, um, letting them get on with, with stuff. Um, and I think I, I've got a feeling that Elizabeth Gaskell wasn't very... Um, kind about Patrick, and I know, I know others haven't been, but you know, it seems to me he deserves, he certainly deserves some credit, as, as was said. Yeah. Um, there were two older sisters, weren't there, that died of tuberculosis as well. What, what do you think they might have written some, another, some other <laughs> novels that were never. There could have been the five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they of course died in, as, as, as children in school. And, you know, some of Jane Eyre addresses 
terrible conditions in 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 the, in the school like the one they were at. Yeah, I d who knows what they might have written. I mean, it's interesting that the that you know there there is the the, the painting, and the music that the Bronte sisters were capable of too, as well as the writing. Um, yeah. I um I imagine them how they wrote in contrast to how we write now. So most of it came out fully formed on the page and they did their rewrites very um, judiciously, whereas now we have complete freedom to chop and change and cut and paste and we employ editors and copywriters and we have degrees in writing um, and peer groups and all sorts of things. So what's happened? Do you think we've lost the spirit of writing that they well, have? I hope you keep your rough drafts. <laughs> and so people can go back and look at the early versions of what, you, what you're working on. Uh, I mean, the, the <clears throat> there are corrections visible on, in that little notebook of Emily's as well as Charlotte's interventions. Obviously, it's interesting to see that, and maybe that is something that is disappearing um, um, in, in today's age. Um, of course, like letters are also disappearing. Um, so all of the sisters kind of wrote about things that nowadays are quite accepted. So sort of in Wuthering Heights, it's sort of quite a few powerful women and stuff like that. Um, and so I imagine at the time that was less kind of acceptable and has only become kind of normalized recently so sort of what was the kind of attitudes towards their writing after perhaps they died and stuff up until nowadays i was sort of wondering yeah well the in the immediate aftermath of of the the novels coming out the first novels of all three of them it was the very many <laughs> the the reviews they had were vicious i quoted some of the lines about them they were thought to be rude barbaric wild vulgar, unformed, etc., etc. Very damaging uh, reviews, which is why Charlotte was so defensive and perhaps conceded too much. But then slowly, as time passed, uh, after their deaths, after Charlotte's success with Jane Eyre and, and, and other novels, things slowly changed. And I think by the early 20th century, Emily was sort of coming through as the exciting one, you know, the, the modern in, in the novel. Wuthering Heights excited people more in the early 20th century than than Jane Eyre did. Um, so, you know, it's it's often the story, isn't it, by of, of in, innovative art of any kind that there's initially a resistance and scorn, and then gradually people see what's going on and learn to appreciate it. Well, they realised they were women when after Charlotte and Anne went down to London and, and, and went... That became public, that wasn't just within the public. They, they told them and then it, it all gradually came out. Um, and, and then, you know, the, the Bronte mania began very quickly, really. People were coming to Haworth and wanting to see where the Bronte sisters had lived and see the parsonage and that whole... Bronte uh, business, if you like, <laughs> of uh, paraphernalia began, uh, you know, within, I don't know, a decade or two of their deaths. So, I mean, Charlotte didn't live that much longer than, than Emily, was it something like seven years? So, um, by the time she died, and Elizabeth, once Elizabeth Gaskell's book came out, you know, you had the whole mythology around the Brontes. Hello. Um, I was really interested that you raised at the very beginning this notion that Emily Bronte is now being portrayed as anorexic. Um, I'm a teacher and my students, my sixth form students, are fascinated, obsessed with the idea that Emily Bronte was anorexic and Emily Dickinson was a lesbian and that Virginia Woolf had complex post-traumatic disorder. Um, there seems to be an entire universe of post-hoc diagnosis um, that, that people are getting very excited about. Mm. 
And, you know, because you raised it and because we've looked at an awful lot of the ways in which Emily's response to society was unusual, to what extent do you think that that's just a really good way to get a book out of a dead writer? <laughs> And to what extent do you think that uh, an element of applying modern understanding of mental health, for example, can help us understand the work? Well, it's a very good question and a very difficult one to answer. There, there, is, there is a book, is it, is it by Catherine Frank, that um, puts forward the theory of Emily as anorexic. And I have to say, there isn't that, to me, there's not that much evidence in that book to, to to make her case. It's an interesting case. Of course it is. But, you know, I'm, she seemed to like cooking. There, isn't, there was not much hint of aversion to food. Um, and um, in general, look, if, you know, there are, there are clearly all sorts of things going on in Wuthering Heights that in, people will find interesting in terms of, what, you know, relations between the sexes, um, and you know all sorts of mental health, uh, um, obsession, fashion, and so on that makes sense to people today. That's fine. I just I suppose I'm I'm reluctant to, you know, as with the Eagleton case who was mentioned earlier, the you know somebody who sees the Brontes or any individual novel in terms of a particular ideology, and only only through the eyes of that ideology, I find it dispiriting and hard to read that stuff. Um, but I don't know, your, your pupils love the novel because they find stuff in it that's relevant to them today, is what you're saying, right? Well, a lot of them do, but yes, yes, they, they do adore it. More than Jane Eyre? It's much trendier than Jane Eyre now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, it is such a complex novel. I mean, the, the whole structure of it and the, the different narr narrations. We've got a question from online, but there's a question up here. Uh, yep. Two people have been waiting. Yeah, I did have a question. Sorry. Two questions on that row. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll ask my question. Okay. Um, where did she draw her? Poetic influences from. Well, I think there were others. Others will answer that question better than I can. I think there were there were ballads, and was there a particular anthology of ballads that the Brontes were particularly into? Scottish verse. I don't know. Um, they just. I mean, they did read very widely. There, there is sometimes this theory that you know they were locked away in Howarth in this rugged, distant spot and so on you know there were good libraries available Keithley Bradford etc not too far away they were very very widely read from an early age but if they refer to other writers themselves uh, and particularly Emily Bronte in terms of her her, her poetry I mean I, know, I don't know I'm just no well and of course Emily we there's so little of, of Emily that's there um, to refer to but uh, Bronte scholars would tell you, I'm not a Bronte scholar, there is that huge biography by, is it Elspeth Barker, is it? The big, the big life that's eight or 900 pages. There will certainly be answers to your question in that. Forgive me that I can't answer it. There was another question in that row, I thought, but... Mm. I'm going to usurp the question, if I may. Um, thank you to you both. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to answer this question, but Kate... Would you mind reading us another poem, or perhaps rereading one of the poems? Is that allowed? Sure, yeah. I guess so. Have we got any particular one you'd like to hear again? No, they're all marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> the, stars, the, stars. the stars, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, good choice, stars. Ah, <clears throat> oh, why the dazzling sun restored our earth to joy. Have you departed, every one, and left a desert sky? All through the night, your glorious eyes were gazing down in mine. 
and with a full heart's thankful sighs, I blessed that watch divine. I was at peace and drank your beams as they were life to me and reveled in my changeful dreams like petrel on the sea. Thought followed thought, star followed star, through boundless regions on. While one sweet influence, near and far, thrilled through and proved us one. Why did the morning dawn to break so great, so pure a spell, and scorch with fire the tranquil cheek where your cool radiance fell? Blood red he rose, and arrows straight, his fierce beam struck my brow. The soul of nature sprang elate, but mine sank sad and low. My lids closed down, yet through their veil I saw him blazing still, and steep in gold the misty dale and flash upon the hill. I turned me to the pillow then, to call back night and see your solemn worlds of and see your worlds of solemn light again throb with my heart and me. It would not do. The pillow glowed and glowed both roof and floor. And birds sang loudly in the wood and fresh winds shook the door. The curtains waved, the wakened flies were murmuring round my room imprisoned there till I should rise and give them leave to roam. O oh, stars and dreams and gentle night, O oh, night and stars return, and hide me from the hostile light that does not warm but burn, that drains the blood of suffering men, drinks tears instead of dew. Let me sleep through his blinding rain and only wake with you. Um, we've had a question from the online audience um, somebody would like to know Karen has asked what was the most surprising thing you found in the manuscripts um, I suppose that <clears throat> that last poem that Kate read and the extent of Charlotte's fiddling with it was the most surprising thing. I'd, I'd heard people talk about Charlotte's interventions and I'd never actually seen it on the page till, till I read that poem. And as I say, I think Emily's was the better version. <laughs> but um, in some of the uh, some editions of the poems, you still find Charlotte's version, uh, which must have appeared in 1851 or, and, and, you know, a later edition of the poems. So it's great now to have the notebook proving what the photographs showed that this is what Emily wrote uh, before our Charlotte fiddled. Yeah. May I ask one more if there isn't an, an urgent cue? Um, of the lines that you read, the, the chill poem, which are Emily's lines, but it's not Emily's poem, how did you, what was the story of the creation of that poem? Um, That's... Well, I just went through writing you down... You made it out of her work. What's yeah, I mean, they're all... Here the world is chill, uh, that, that one, which yeah. maybe Kate will read it again. They're all Emily lines from different poems. I just wrote, wrote them down thinking, wow, good line, powerful image. And then I thought, well, I'll have a bit of fun, I'll put them together. And I'll take, I won't have the quatrains, I won't have recurrent rhymes. Um, I'll just pick out the, um, the images. So that, that's a story, really. Um, bit of fancifulness on my part, but it reads very well. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find the pages one, actually. Here you are. Oh. Oh, is it? <laughs> oh, there it is, yeah. <laughs> Let me do it like that. Here the world is chill, turf sod and tombstone, dank moss dripping from the wall. What gloomy guests beneath the turf, beneath the mould, the common path that others run. There was a time when my cheek burned, love like a rose briar, the house dog on the glowing floor. Sweet land of light, 
I saw my fate without its mask, this wild breeze with me. My darling pain, the little lamp burns straight, dreading every breeze. The night is darkening round me, I'll walk where the flocks are feeding and the wind blows on the mountainside. I'm true to my wild will. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to call my next book My Darling Pain. Yeah. It's such a good line. Good. We have another question at the back, if we may. Yes. Thanks. Um, thank you very much um, for a really interesting talk and, and the great readings. Um, I'm pretty new to Emily Bronte's poetry myself and struggling um, to some extent, as I do with all new, um, new um, writing to me. I wondered whether you thought, um, I, I, I understand a lot of the poems are lifted from her writings with Anne, the Gondal writings, which is a kind of, as I understand it, a kind of vast, lost historical epic, um, and that the poems are often um, characters from this wider epic, and um, sometimes possibly they read like sort of like arias where the action stops and there's a sort of just kind of emotional interlude and I just wondered what you thought as a as a poet and writer of many different forms whether this is um, a strength or a weakness um, of these particular poems when we try and uh, ap approach them um, really well there's a difficulty uh, and you'll find if you look at editions, scholarly editions of the poems, in the notes at the end, they'll say that you know, this is a gondol poem where Emily is using the voice of this character. And there is that problem of trying to, to know which was from the, the epic, the gondol epic, and which is a, from the heart Emily poem. And I think, I think in that notebook, um, she was trying to put down her poems from her, as it were, not not gondol poems. Um, but you know, the best thing is to get you know persevere, get a con get a, a, a scholarly edition of the poems. There are a couple of good ones, OUP and Penguin, and uh, and have a look. Um, you have to say that even if she's in, in, invented characters and this vo this poem is coming through the voice of this character, doesn't it still? carry something of Emily's and it's partly to do with her thoughts, what draws her, what what gets her feeling and thinking. So, you know, I'm always, I'm reluctant to rule things out because there might have been a gondola context, context. The first poem that Kate read, The Old Stoic, is sometimes seen as just an exercise. It's an old Stoic speaking, it's not Emily. But those, some of those lines are so Emily-ish. <laughs> Mm. Insofar as we know, Emily, I think. Um, so I'm not ruling that one out either. Yeah. Any further questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, just a quick one. Um, I really liked that last poem um, that was read, and I completely didn't take in who it was by or what you said about it. Can you just give us a quick reminder of that? Yes, that was a poem by Maura Dooley, um, a poet write, writing today. It's from a, a new collection of hers. And it, it, it talks about um, it, you know, the Brontes in general. There's a visit to Anne Brontes' grave in Scarborough. There's a visit to Howarth. as she reflects on, if you like, Bronte memorabilia. And then she um, quotes from something her grandmother had written in a, in a, a book about the Brontes. Um, it sounds like an academic book, The Novels of the Bronte Sisters, Pilot, 1947. Um, it's just a beautiful thing that the, the grandmother says, uh, which I think sums up sometimes why writers <coughs> stick with us. Um, I think if you'd like to hear us again, maybe that's a good, good way to finish. Um, if Kate can... Oh, goodness, OK. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's the very last page. I've mixed them all up, though, now. Uh, OK. <laughs> right. Um, I've got it, if need be. Uh, 
Oh. The unforgotten. I've got half of it. <laughs> I've got the first half. Is it okay? That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the unforgotten. At Anne Bronte's grave, in the salt air she loved, where words were almost lost from the stone, dissolving, you first kissed me. And once we took my parents to see the rain, the moorland, the tiny writing we struggled to read, stepping out dazed into that garden of tombs, gleaming in the damp light. And sometimes I swipe at crumbs or dry plates with my souvenir linen image of three melded heads, fading indistinct. But today, I open a beaten copy of The Novels of the Bronte Sisters, Pilot 1947, the only thing left of my grandmother's time on earth, to read in her bold, emphatic hand. Nearer than the living are the unforgotten dead. Their presence is ever with you, and they walk always at your side. Um, and with that, I'd like to just thank you both for bringing us into such a wonderful and intimate evening and into such an extraordinary, extraordinary body of work. I'm very grateful. Thanks all for joining us. Thanks to everybody that joined us online. And uh, please give our speakers a huge round of applause.